All right, we are going to get started here. Um, so it is my great pleasure to introduce Anthony Fronte from FTI, um, a man of many accomplishments. And uh, we will start chatting here, and um, I'll ask some starter questions. But I hope that all of you will uh, have uh, questions to ask Anthony as well, and we can have a discussion of um, many relevant, timely, and challenging policy and legal questions that uh, Anthony has encountered during his multifaceted, long career in security. So, with that, if I may, I'll ask you to, if you'd be so kind, share us your share us the story of your career, how you got involved in security what you wanted to do when you grew up and how you ended up before us in your current role. Great. Yeah. So uh, thanks for having me here today and thanks for joining. Uh, it's good to see some old friends in the audience. Uh, it's, uh, I always love uh, coming to uh, Black Hat and DEF CON for exactly that reason. It feels like a reunion. Um, but the question was, uh, you know, how did I start my career? And believe it or not, I've been working in security, specifically cybersecurity, for 30 years. And many in the audience, especially those in the front row, are going to look at me and say, how is that even possible, uh, 30 years uh, in security? I started when I was 10. I started hacking computers uh, 10 years old in my, uh, in my living room after my folks purchased uh, an Apple IIc+. Uh, many of you are in the audience smiling uh, and laughing because uh, you all know the Apple IIc Plus now sits in the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, D.C. It's quite a dinosaur. Uh, anyway, I started when I was 10 and continued uh, as a hobbyist uh, through college. When I graduated, I started working in private practice as an ethical hacker at a big four consulting firm. Uh, loved what I did, worked with a bunch of like-minded individuals. We got paid to break into uh, corporate corporations. Um, unfortunately, I was living and working in New York City uh, at that time and had uh, experienced firsthand the effects of uh, September 11th, 2001, and it really changed my outlook on life and some of my motivations. So I actually went back to work uh, shortly after 9-11 and uh, quit my job and uh, went back to school to get a master's degree in uh, computer science and then joined the FBI. I was uh, pretty passionate about uh, uh, the national security mission and uh, supporting the United States uh, in that capacity. So I quit my job in private practice, joined the FBI, and uh, they sent me, uh, shortly after that, they sent me down to Quantico, Virginia, where I was at uh, New Agents Training. Uh, graduated from uh, New Agents Training down in Quantico, and they sent me right back to New York City, where I worked as a cybersecurity special agent investigating uh, all cyber matters related to national security. I was hunting uh, terrorists online and, and spies online. Uh, quite uh, an opportunity for me. Um, as you can appreciate, it was uh, extremely fascinating work. Proud to say that in my nine years as a field agent in New York City, uh, I worked thousands of incidents, um, some major breaches, uh, major compromise at NASDAQ in 2010, uh, for example, and then also some really small breaches. Uh, uh, but safe to say, uh, definitely had my fair share of security incidents in New York City and loved every minute of it. Um, in 2013, I promoted. I went to FBI headquarters in Washington, D.C., where I served as a, uh, the, the chief of staff for FBI Cyber Division, uh, overseeing uh, administratively and operationally uh, all um, matters within the division, uh, supporting the assistant director. That was a fascinating time. Uh, was able to live through and, and help navigate some of the most significant breaches uh, or incidents of our time uh, during that period from 2013 to 2015. Uh, notable one was the destructive malware attack at Sony Pictures Entertainment. And then I would say uh, I was very proud that in 2015, um, uh, leadership at the FBI promoted me again and sent me over to the White House to serve in the Obama administration as a apolitical appointee. I was detailed as an FBI special agent to the National Security Council where I worked as the director for cyber incident response. 
Um, and many people say, you know, what was your job? I was very fortunate. Uh, um, my role it, on the National Security Council was I, I worked on a team of, uh, of cybersecurity practitioners. Um, and my role was to choreograph U.S. government response efforts to any significant cyber event that affected uh, U.S. interests. Uh, foreign or domestic. Uh, so as you can appreciate, it was a very busy time. And one of the reasons why I'm here today is because uh, during my time in the National Security Council, I uh, and a few colleagues uh, led the preparedness and response efforts leading into the 2016 U.S. presidential election, specific to cybersecurity. Uh, happy to talk about that. Uh, it's a very relevant topic, especially as we go into the 2020 uh, uh, U.S. presidential election, um, and uh, I can assure you the threats that we faced then and continue to face today are indeed real, um, and it's something that we should uh, take very seriously. So that said, um, you know, happy to have a conversation. Welcome audience participation. Uh, so if I may, I'll ask to follow up on the point that you just raised. Can, what can you tell us about the the mindset, the approach, the uh, analysis that happened around combating the the Russian interference threats that were happening and continue to happen in 2016. So, from 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 my optics uh, on the National Security Council and within the U.S. government, there was really, uh, I would say, a two pronged approach. There was the the uh, massive uh, coordinated. Um, uh, misinformation campaign, right? The influence operations, which have uh, serious effects. And then there was also the very tactical um, probing operation that uh, the Russian government partook in. Uh, and and you know, it's it's very easy to confuse one or the other, but I think it's really important that to understand that both were taking place in real time. Uh, and uh, the effects of both operations uh, were, were definitely significant and um, quite possibly uh, still ongoing today. So you mentioned that you got your start in security very early. Can you tell us about some of the adventures, your earliest adventures, and uh, whether you were uh, ahead of your time and always stayed perfectly in line with what would be the standards today of uh, slightly transgressive conduct, or were you more experimental as many people were? Yeah, I was definitely experimental um, and, and really just super curious about security. I mean, when I started, uh, the internet uh, in, in, in your home didn't even exist. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when we finally did get the internet in the, in, at home, it was a very significant day, right? When I first started, it was just programming. Uh, you know, I, I started uh, writing my first programs at 10 years old, and uh, in addition to writing my own, I started to look at other people's code and try to uh, break their code. Um, but it was all curiosity, looking to push the limits. I did a few times throughout my career uh, discover certain things where I would present them to senior, uh, senior folks, and they would say, oh, wait, show me that again. How did you do that? Um, and of course, anyone who's ever hacked a computer knows that's a very uh, rewarding moment. Uh, you feel very proud. Uh, and I'm, I'm proud to say that uh, I felt uh, proud at those times, um, but it just continued. And I will say that uh, I don't regret it for one minute, of course. When I did quit my job in private practice and joined the U.S. government and, and, and really helping the United States uh, um, combat uh, these threats online, uh, I don't regret it for a minute, of course. It was extremely rewarding. And uh, I'm proud to say that, that myself and my colleagues in the FBI made a considerable impact on, on these fronts, uh, specifically with respect to terrorism uh, and, and intelligence operations. So DOJ uh, is uh, currently proposing uh, innovative ways of uh, potentially building out engagement with uh, workforce development and keeping kids uh, on the non-intrusion side yeah. of, of the line. Do you have any thoughts about how to encourage 
yeah. building talent while still staying out yeah. of legal trouble as the computer fraud and abuse act exists today. Yeah. No, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm glad DOJ is taking that stance. Uh, when I was in the U.S. government, I was beating that drum for many years. Uh, and, and unfortunately, uh, I was dismissed for many years. But I do think government leaders are finally realizing that they need to to really work with private sector to continue to develop this workforce. The cybersecurity workforce, as you all know, is extremely lacking. Uh, there's just not enough really good talent to staff the, the roles uh, that are needed, uh, whether it's in the government or in private practice. So I think it's smart for governments around the world to establish programs with private practice entities, maybe develop a sabbatical program, um, you know, two years, uh, private practice employees can, can go work for the U.S. government or, or the government in their home government and vice versa. Um, I think there not only will be a, a knowledge exchange, a very beneficial knowledge exchange, but there will also be the ability to train um, cross-train uh, in different uh, industries, right? Private uh, versus public. Uh, but then also keep uh, people fresh, keep people on their toes, let people peek behind the curtain working for the U.S. government and realize, okay, this is what it's all about. Then go back to private practice and vice versa. I, I definitely think it would be extremely beneficial. And I think you would see less of a brain drain in the government or in private practice. So you mentioned working on the NASDAQ investigation. What were some of the challenges that you experienced in conducting that investigation and uh, the context of a market integrity driven compromise that presented different concerns that other kinds of compromise that you, compromises that you had dealt with before? Or was it functionally the same? From yeah, I mean, I hate to say it, having worked, again, having worked uh, thousands of these, not only in, a, in the capacity of the U.S. government, but also in private practice, these incidents really have a, uh, first of all, no two incidents are alike, but they do have common themes. Um, and, and while, while uh, NASDAQ did in 2010 experience a, 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 an incident, um, it's not unique to NASDAQ. It's happening every single day. I think the latest statistic I read was in 2019 right now, um, every day two organizations are experiencing a significant incident. Two. Two a day. Uh, so that's pretty significant. Um, so we certainly don't want to pick on any single one organization or highlight them as being deficient because uh, this is an evolving threat and it can happen uh, very quickly, very easily. Um, right, these systems are designed to be to allow organizations to operate more efficiently, uh, uh, more effectively globally, and and um, you know to use a to use a a very overly used term, um, you're as strong as your weakest link, uh, and some of these experience some of these organizations experience that firsthand. Is it your sense that financial services and uh, market? Uh, makers and, and other key players in financial infrastructure learned from the NASDAQ compromise and did uh, a more aggressive self-reflective exercise around not being the next NASDAQ or what's your sense of the evolution yeah, of NASDAQ? Yeah, and again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even uh, single out NASDAQ. I think, I think financial services uh, in particular, they're constantly learning from their peers, not only in financial services, but across all sectors. Right, they're extremely well funded. They they're they're regulated. They have responsibilities uh, being in the industry, um, so they're constantly learning every single day. Uh, I I think I think what we're seeing now is more and more organizations are experiencing um, these types of incidents, uh, and not because it's a fault of their own, but just because it's a result of the threat constantly evolving. And, and, and people having different types of motivations, whether it's personal data, financial information, uh, sabotage, for, to name a few. So you also mentioned the Sony compromise. And so that presents perhaps a different kind of model of the motivations in particular yeah. that you were talking about. Can you give us a little flavor for what was happening in the Sony situation as you were investigating it? Yeah, so Sony Sony, Sony, was, Sony Pictures Entertainment was, a, was a, an ex very significant matter, uh, really for two purposes. One, because it was a, a nation state actor, uh, North Korea to be specific. And, 
you know, I would have said four or five years ago, if someone said that North Korea was going to be one of the top four cyber threats in the world, I would have probably laughed it off, um, thinking how, but they really are. Uh, and many don't know this, but North Korea affected the uh, breach or the destructive attack at uh, Sony Pictures Entertainment with a Windows 95 machine. <laughs> Wait, okay? And, and I'm sure many of you won't be surprised to know that it was an unlicensed version of Windows 95. Okay? So my point is, is one was the, the, the fact that North Korea affected this destructive malware attack. The, the other uh, learning factor of the destructive malware attack at Sony Pictures Entertainment is just the effects on an organization. Like many people think, okay, the computer systems were down. What does that mean? Employees at Sony went to work that day and they went to badge in and the, and the gate to the parking lot wouldn't go up. It wouldn't open. So they had to manually raise it and go in. Then they parked. Then they couldn't badge into doors because the key card readers didn't work. Then they went to their desk and couldn't get on their systems. So what did most employees do? What I would do is say, let's go get a cup of coffee. They walked to the cafeteria, got a cup of coffee and went to pay. And they said, the systems are down. You can't pay. So cash only. Well, I don't have cash. Well, you know, pay me tomorrow. And this continued, right, through the end of the week. Friday was payday. People showed up for work and said, you didn't pay me to accounting. Accounting looked at them and said, well, who are you? He said, I've worked here for 20 years. They say, I'm sorry, we have no record of you. Our systems are down. So these are real effects of a, of a destructive malware attack like that. And, and, and it was a real wake-up call in the security industry uh, with respect to, one, don't underestimate your adversary or the, or the, global, your, the global stage of adversaries that, it, that could exist. And two, of course, from a security perspective, we, we all know, and I'm sure everyone in this room can appreciate, um, there's no silver bullet, right? We're never going to be able to prevent an incident from occurring, but we all want to, what we want to aim to do is prevent incidents uh, from being large incidents, right? If you're going to get hit with ransomware, have it hit two or three machines, not two or three hundred machines or two or three thousand machines. Um, so keep incidents small. So that's just an example of the real life effects uh, uh, that took place uh, on the on the studio lot of Sony Pictures Entertainment. So in light of what you saw in that case of Sony, does it worry you that we're building a whole society and a whole global economy driven by a high degree of interreliance on systems that are vulnerable to similar compromise potential? Of course. Yeah, of course. It worries me every single day. That's why I'm in the, in the industry. Uh, working very hard uh, with uh, governments, the United States government, foreign governments, uh, practitioners like everyone in this room. Um, no single person or no single government can do it alone, right? We're, we'd be naive to think that. And I think, you know, I can say this, having having been a uh, formerly a U.S. government employee, that the, the U.S. government now is realizing that, hey, you know, we have unique skills and access, but we can't do it alone. We have to rely on private sector practitioners because they are equally as skilled and have uh, um, great access and sometimes better access than the government. And together, we're just going to be that much stronger. So in light of that need for future cooperation and the challenges we face, where do you see the future of security going? What are your sort of top two or three threats that you see looming on the horizon in the next five years? And what would you advise us to be on the lookout for or uh, most actively trying to mitigate to make sure that we don't turn into one big Sony pictures? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a good point. And actually, it starts uh, to what you said earlier, this, this continued uh, growth of interdependencies on on these systems. You know, it's funny. Um, I gave you a quick snapshot of my background. One thing I forgot was that uh, for 14 years, I taught undergraduate and graduate level computer science courses at Fordham University. And every semester, I would start my course and challenge my students and say, name one aspect of your life that does not involve a computer network. And the students would scratch their heads and they'd raise their hand and say, oh, I came to class. And I'd say, no, the subway you took is controlled by a computer network. 
Someone would say, well, I drove my car. And I'd say, no, the street lights are controlled by a computer network. So you get where I'm going with this. And the point is, is that every single thing we do, even 15 years ago, is controlled by a computer network. And to your point, it's only going to continue to, to grow and become integrated more and more into our lives. Smart home technology, voice assistant technologies. I mean, all these things are great, right? And I work with my clients every single day. I love these tools. Um, and I think we should embrace them for their conveniences, for their comforts. The only thing I tell my clients is let's do it safely, right? Let's embrace IoT. Let's just do it safely, right? Every, I'm sure everyone got here via, via airplane or, or car, right? Came to Vegas. If I told you you could come here on a really fast airplane, right, that would shave hours off your commute, you would say, oh, that's great. I want to I wanna ride that airplane. But then I'd say, oh, by the way, it's not very safe. You, st you know, most people would back away and say, I'll go the old way and spend a few extra hours in the plane. My point is, is that the more and more uh, as our world becomes interconnected, uh, this is great opportunity, opportunity to grow, generate more revenue, become more efficient. Uh, we just want to do it safely. That's my biggest worry. Uh, I'd say to put it in a nutshell, it is IoT. People ask me all the time, what is the biggest thing that keeps you up all night? Up all night. Um, some people say, oh, an, at an attack on our power grid, right? That's an effect. The power going out is an effect of the attack. What's going to cause that attack, I think, in my opinion, is this, this emergence of IoT devices. I think the latest statistic is every day 5.5 million devices come online. Right? There's going to be 50 billion devices by 2025 or 2020. Uh, astronomical numbers. Uh, and all those devices are little machines that can be compromised and used in a massive, large-scale attack. A lot of people don't know. I was at the White House at the time. But in late October, before the 2016 U.S. presidential election, the uh, Internet went down four, three times. It was late October. It was about 10 days before the election. The internet went down uh, as the public knows it, right? Anybody who's skilled in the industry knows that the internet didn't go down, just uh, major service was compromised at a single tech technology company. DNS had gone down, right? It was exploited. So I'm at the White House, and as far as the world knows, or, or the US government knows, and the general public go knows, the internet's down. So I get the phone call, what's going on? I call uh, the FBI, DHS, Department of Homeland Security, um, Department of Defense, the NSA, nobody knows. All we know is that DNS on the internet in the United States, large regions of the United States, um, is down. And you're talking major websites, Twitter, Amazon. Some of you may recall as I tell the story. So I didn't know what was going on. I do know that myself and probably a thousand other of my colleagues throughout the U.S. government were working very hard and were laser focused in our preparedness and response efforts leading into the 2016 presidential election. Laser focused. And now the Internet's out 10 days before the election. We didn't know what was going on. So it happened once. We didn't know. Comes back online. Everything's fine for a few hours. It happens again. So now we're starting to get nervous. Now the West Wing at the White House is saying, we want hourly updates. What is going on? Still nobody knows throughout the US government. To make matters worse, the New York Times publishes a breaking news alert. Russia is testing their capabilities to knock out the internet on election day. Now, I listen carefully to what I just said. Testing their capabilities to knock out the internet on election day. That right there was a, one of the many fears that we were concerned with on election day. In our preparedness and response efforts, we were focused on the availability of U.S. citizens to go to polling stations and vote, cast their ballot, uh, tally those ballots, and then report those results uh, to the network, uh, to the networks. So when you went home at the end of the day, you could watch election night results come in in real time. That was a major concern because the internet is heavily used for the reportability of, of, of election night results. So we were extremely concerned. And as everyone knows in computer security, 
if you're really good, you're not going to do it just once. You're not going to step up to the plate and, and, and just do it once. You're going to practice. So we were really concerned. We were significantly concerned. Um, fortunately, the FBI was on the case and working very hard. The FBI tracked it to a major uh, technology company in New England. And they dispatched uh, local uh, field agents to the organization uh, within a few hours. And those agents worked with the technology company who immediately threw their hands in the air and said, we know we can't stop it. Come to find out there was a vulnerability in their infrastructure that had been exploited. And it was, it was indeed knocking out DNS for uh, large swaths of uh, companies that relied on this, on this organization, effectively appearing that the internet was down. The internet was not down, as we all know. So the FBI worked with the company, with the Department of Homeland Security, with others in the intelligence community to fix this vulnerability and to prevent it from happening again. So of course, the FBI immediately launched an investigation and wouldn't you know that that vulnerability was exploited by the Mirai botnet. We're all familiar with the Mirai botnet. It leveraged IoT devices. So if you have a DVR at home or an IP camera or smart TV, you may have been involved in this large-scale attack 10 days before the U.S. presidential election that was briefed to the President of the United States every hour on the hour. Okay? Uh, what many don't know is that... Um, the way this attack was facilitated was because there were two, uh, the, I, I believe the FBI has uh, um, made an announcement on this, but uh, this vulnerability was exploited by the Mirai botnet um, at the hands of two teenage kids who were, didn't realize what they had done. They had downloaded this code and uh, executed it, and um, they didn't realize what they were doing um, until after the FBI had investigated and knocked on their door. So. I guess my point is, it's a long way of telling, it's a long story and a long way of answering. My fear is the emergence of IoT devices um, coming online every single day and the lack of security baked into those devices and the lack of appreciation by organizations um, to really fully appreciate their effects. Okay, and with that, we will open it up to the audience for questions. And please do come up to the mic so that we can hear you well. Hi, I just had a question. Is there an incentive for any uh, political group in the government right now to turn away uh, the help from a foreign government that's trying to influence in their direction? Is there, any, aside from being the ethical thing to do, is to turn away that, uh, you know? But is there any like incentive for them not to accept that incentive for 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 that for for to 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 try to stop the 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 influence campaigns that are benefiting them to stay in power? Uh, I mean, of course, there's constantly uh, uh, intelligence, counterintelligence operations that are taking place every single day in the government. Uh, and any sorts of foreign influence operations uh, are, are uh, being watched very closely. But like, is there an incentive for them not to accept it or to try to stop it if, it help, if it's helping them stay in power? Is there sanction? Is there sanction? Um, I mean, I'm not the authority on this. I can just say from uh, from my experience in the U.S. government, um, there are protocols in place and how to how to uh, how to respond to any sort of uh, approach or or influence that that uh, may take place. Um, hi, I actually have two questions. So um, you said you were worried about IoT, mm -hmm. but as everything moved into the cloud, do you think there are more um, security and privacy concern in that sense for your client? Yeah, so the cloud is a great question. Uh, it's, a great, it's another great example of, of uh, just the migration of data. What the cloud does is it opens up the attack surface, mm -hmm. right? You, you have the availability of, of this infrastructure 24-7. Uh, I do think there's there's this misunderstanding of uh, uh, with organizations that think they take their data and they migrate it to a cloud-based infrastructure and then they no longer have a responsibility for that. Um, of course, that's not the case, uh, and 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 organizations should think about it with respect to third-party risk, mm -hmm. right? Just because you put it in a cloud infrastructure doesn't mean that you don't have uh, a responsibility to protect um, that data. 
uh, whatever it may be. Uh, that data could be personal uh, consumer data of your of your clients. Mm -hmm. It could be the operations of your in, of your of your of your operations themselves. I mean, so there is that responsibility that doesn't that doesn't go away. Um, but then, do you see it surpass IoT, like cloud security and privacy? No, I don't see it surpassing IoT, and this is just my opinion. I see IoT as the greatest uh, threat, just because you know it's just so many devices coming online every single day, mm -hmm. um, and so I, I would see it as, as also uh, a security concern, um, but something that can most definitely be managed. I see. And then the next one is because um, you mentioned about 2016 presidential. Uh, uh, election. Can you elaborate on what are some of the steps you guys take for protecting voters' privacy? Because you mentioned fraud is the focus and threat, but what about privacy? Privacy of like voters' privacy. Voters, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, that's a, that's a really interesting question um, because, and the reason why it's so interesting is because, of course, um, as we all know or may know. Um, elections are run by the states, mm -hmm. by the states themselves. So the states have ultimate authority over how they run their elections. Mm -hmm. And and of course, you know, when we were in the government, when I was in the government and we were laser focused on this topic, um, at no point did we wish to interfere with that. What we wanted to do was just inform the states with the threat, right? Mm -hmm. Cybersecurity is about risk management. Mm -hmm. If you don't know the risks, you, you can't protect against them, right? You don't know what you don't know. And so what we did was we went on a massive campaign to educate states and oh. county officials about the risks. Now, do I still think it's important, back to your question about protecting uh, uh, user information? Absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, states, based on my conversations, not only as a, as a government employee, but then also as a private uh, mm -hmm. citizen in private practice, I've spent the last two and a half years meeting with dozens and dozens of state election officials. Um, they are very focused on this topic and working very hard to protect uh, their infrastructure and their user data. The only thing I would say, and this is really for for uh, you know citizens to understand and appreciate, and if anyone's going to change it, it's going to be the American people, mm -hmm. is that a lot of this voter information is publicly available. Yeah. You know, for 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 a small fee, you can go to City Hall and buy it. Mm -hmm. So it's just something to consider. I see. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Um, are people in your position whose job it is to uh, kind of defend America's networks empowered um, legally and technologically to do that job? And if not, what are your top one or two uh, wish list items for what you need to do a better job? Thanks. So can we back up a little bit on your question? Um, um, you know, people in my position empowered to protect America's networks, um, right? I mean, we have the full resources available at my organization when our clients retain us to help them defend their networks, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't lie. Um, I, I would love to have more technical staff. Um, and, and I think, you know, I'm, there are many in my position that would love to uh, meet and, and, and hire uh, more technical people. Um, but like I said earlier, that's a challenge that private industry and, and the public sector is facing right now. Um, I do think um, in my current capacity, I absolutely have the resources I need. Um, I know that I can work with uh, private organizations to help them defend their networks. I also know that I can pick up the phone and call not only the United States government, but foreign governments uh, and request assistance and, and we'll get it and, and have done so over the last two and a half years. Um, I would say that that is a product of me having been on the government side and knowing that there are a lot of willing and able people in government and in private practice who want to help, right? We all want to do the right thing, right? Uh, they want to help and it's just a matter of knowing that you can reach out and call them and you will get that help. That's why, again, back to probably 25 minutes ago when I said, this, this sabbatical program, this exchange between public and private sector would be extremely beneficial because I think if we did it officially, there'd be a lot of people in the government who could go out to private practice, um, experience, exactly as you said, defending networks and helping organizations defend against threats, um, 
from the private practice perspective, which is totally different than serving as a government employee, um, and of course vice versa. Uh, so, speaking of your time back with the FBI, you said you coordinated some of the response efforts when um, nation states or others were attacking U.S. infrastructure, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, given some of the new policies about uh, defend forward and preemptive defense type stuff coming out of Department of Defense, um, since this is a, an ethics conversation, how do you feel about how that, that direction is going? It's no longer about just defending and protecting. It's, well, we need to, we need to take the first step to yeah. defend ourselves. That's a, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked it. It's, it's you know, and I, I've actually gone on the record on this. I'm, I've, I've published some thought leadership. Uh, and actually, uh, I, I think it's, it can be extremely risky. And I think, uh, I think the U.S. government needs to in, in my opinion, I think the U.S. government needs to slow down and think long and hard about this topic because, because what happened at Sony is a great example, okay? Um, nor the, the North Korea felt threatened by the United States and they attacked a private organization, okay? Sony didn't get any, any, any restitution or any support from North Korea, Right? They couldn't sue them. Yes, there were sanctions, and those sanctions are being felt, trust me. Um, but Sony's a private organization. So, so I just think it's very, very risky. I think there needs to be a lot of thought put to it. And, and, and I think rather than be forward-leaning and, and offense first, there should be some very serious uh, uh, um, confidence-building measure discussions taking place, some normalization of standards of behavior, um, um, because I think that will be extremely beneficial in, in building trust and confidence between nations. Um, and, and uh, you know, we need to be careful, because if we do take an offensive approach first, we need to be prepared if our adversaries strike back. Are we prepared? And, and um, I don't know if we've really thought about that. How do we not get into the problem we have now with nuclear weapons where we're just this mutually assured destruction of all of our technology, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that, that's exactly the, the thought leadership I published on this actually, you know, compared to what we're going through right now in the cyberspace uh, to the Cuban Missile Crisis. We need to de-escalate, slow down, confidence building measures, you know, establish this mutual trust, these, these, these rules of the road, you know, what is on limits, off limits, uh, and, and, and and have those discussions. I would say it's disappointing that the uh, entire uh, unit at the State Department was dissolved. Um, it's disappointing that there haven't been significant investments in this space um, uh, in the U.S. government, um, uh, particularly in the administration. But, you know, I haven't been there in two and a half years, and there could be other things going on behind the scenes. So I just want to be clear that, that I'm not really informed with respect to that other than what you all are seeing uh, on the, in, the, in the news as well. But at 4 o'clock, the person who in theory knows what's going on is going to be here. So I encourage everyone to stick around for 4 o'clock and ask Josh Steinman. Oh, yes. That is exactly the person you want to talk to. Other questions? No other questions? Thomas? I'll, I'll give you one you more. To ask one, really? Sure. All right, so I'll give you an example. You and I known each other, what, 10 years now? Knew you while you were an agent. He actually, when he started the ICCS conference with Fordham, while he was building out that whole program, which was actually great for the students. So from your time in the Bureau to going to FTI, all the social media disinformation <coughs> campaigns, have you ever seen it happen not towards government, but on companies using the same types of bots and technologies. Yes. Yeah. I would definitely say that that uh, the internet introduces a whole new level of of a whole new ability to affect information, uh, much larger scope and scales than we ever even imagined. Um, 
you know, what happened leading into the 2016 U.S. presidential election was not new. That's not a new technique. It's, you know, a misinformation campaign is not new. What was new that we experienced in the government was at that scope and scale and had that, those sort of effects, okay? That was truly the weaponization of information. That's really what it was, and unfortunately, it, it, it had effects. Um, those effects are extremely hard to prove, right? Because you're talking about people who, who maybe were presented with information and then uh, it changed the way they were thinking. So it's really hard to prove, but uh, it definitely was taking place. Um, and the fact that it was happening at such a large scope and scale was a, was, was a, new, a new level. Um, so now in private practice, having experienced that firsthand and witnessing that, I now know what it looks like and I'm seeing it now in private practice, unfortunately. Right? One of the things, one of the, one of the lessons learned from the 2016 U.S. presidential election and the preparedness and response efforts, and people ask me all the time, you know, what are some of the lessons learned? I say, it's that it, it happened and it can be done again and now it can be repeated and now it's not gonna be just Russia. It's gonna be Iran, North Korea, China, Russia, other adversaries that know it can be done. The playbook has been written. There've been some successes. So now others may be motivated to do it. That's of course in the, in the, in the uh, nation state world. Um, the other reality is that private organizations have seen that it can be done. And now there, uh, I've seen it firsthand, some of the same techniques are being deployed against uh, private companies, against their competitors. So it's a real threat. Um, weaponizing of information, you know, I talk about IoT, um, I talk about, we talked about the cloud infrastructure and the risk there. I would also say uh, another very serious threat on the horizon is the weaponization of information. Uh, Theft of information, releasing it, uh, unauthorized disclosure, uh, deep fakes, right? Just taking real information and either manipulating it or just releasing it. It can be damaging enough, right? I talk to my clients all the time and they, you know, they say, well, that's why we pick up the phone and, and have telephone conversations, right? And I said, well, bad news. <laughs> You're using voice over IP. It rides on the same backbone that your email rides on and, you know, the, the the facial expressions of my of my clients change because they don't realize that you know so now it's going we have to go back to you know just pulling someone aside and having an in person conversation um, it's definitely something to consider good question <laughs> well I've seen it because all right you already know what I've done with Fox and other class so I've seen where people are using it for penny stock manipulation sure. Uh, misinformation on companies when they're trying to play that. So post it on bullet boards, all this bad information, watch the stock go down, do a buy, and then, and there's nothing really you can do about it. It's hard to prove. Unfortunately, the only thing you can do is dox the guy and push it when you find out the real information he's doing. Yeah. You know, going back to the question earlier about just the, the escalation and offense first, you know, it's something to consider, especially if you're going to stick around and, and continue this discussion is, you know, I don't think you'd be wrong to ask our government officials, you know, okay, if that's the, pol if that's the policy that you want to take, uh, that's a policy position you want to take, what happens when adversaries respond and it affects private companies, right? What happens if uh, a major electrical company is 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 shut down, and electricity is out in an entire state, and um, for days or weeks, right? And people say, "Wow, that's that's scary." That you know, that's never happened. I say, "Actually, it has happened twice. It's happened in the Ukraine twice, right? Three days before Christmas, it was cold. Power was out for a few days. Um, you know, and you can ask government officials who responded to that." There was actually videos where uh, the, the operator's screens, their mouse was moving and they weren't touching it. They took out their phones and recorded it. So my point is, is that if you're gonna continue down this road, uh, and it's a really good question, because I think, I think there needs to be given some considerable thought to exactly that. What happens if our adversaries respond and they compromise or take down private sector organizations? Will they receive any support from the government? 
right? And I don't mean, you know, the free assessments from the Department of Homeland Security. You know, I, I mean some significant support, right? Um, Maersk is a great example. They, they fell victim to Petya and Petya. And I think the latest public statistics uh, were, you know, they've invested over $300 million, right? If that happens here in the United States, will organizations get any support? So it's just something to consider. And I think it's a great question. And I, and I think it, it deserves uh, some more uh, poking. You left out Merck, too. When they got hit, they were out of commission for six months. So you're losing out on things like needles when you need them. You know, insulin, all that other type of stuff that the small little things you don't think about. Mm -hmm. And on that insulin related note, it's the uh, perfect note to close on because our next talk will be with the FDA. But I want to thank <laughs> Anthony Ferrante very much for Great. a fascinating hour with us uh, and encourage all of you to take a sticker on your way out to thank you for joining us. Thank you.